Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another Thursday evening program with the Genealogy Center. We're so glad that you joined us. And if we've confused you a little bit about a joint introduction, well, that's not necessarily intentional, but this has been kind of a roll with it, roll with it kind of a day. So Elizabeth, you received a communique earlier today, and that kind of changed the course of this evening, right? Yes. So due to some unforeseen circumstances, our speaker for this evening could not actually attend. Uh, so we decided to offer you something a little bit different. So instead of the scheduled program, which we will look to reschedule in the future, um, we thought we would turn this into a preservation fireside chat format. So this evening, we'd really like to hear from you about what kinds of preservation questions that you have, uh, what kind of preservation issues you've encountered, uh, what kind of lore you've heard about how to best preserve your family heirlooms, documents, artifacts. We'd really like this to be an hour where you can chat amongst yourselves if you'd like, but also we really welcome your questions in the Q&A. So we can basically go through Q&A and create a nice discussion uh, maybe some of the questions will prompt some thoughts that you have. Maybe some of the uh, things that Elizabeth and I articulate will remind you of some things that you found useful and how you preserve things. Uh, we all like to, without damaging our artifacts, do things as economical as possible. So maybe you have some fun facts on, on how to do that as well. So please do uh, put your questions uh, in the Q&A. Feel free to use the chat feature to tell us where you're from, to crowdsource information amongst yourselves, to pick up some wonderful tips from those who are joining us this evening. I guess um, it's wonderful. We have one question in the Q&A already, so we're going to get to that in just a moment. I guess I just want to start with um, a real pedestrian comment. I think some of you might be able to relate to that, um, and that is, as family historians, as people who really cherish our family stories and have a great zeal for finding more of our family stories, we always have an eye peeled toward preserving those and passing those along to, to our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren's great-grandchildren, whom we will never meet. Uh, so, but oftentimes I find that we think about it and we muse about it and we think some more and we ponder some more and we lose a couple of documents and we lose a couple of electronic files and we think some more. I guess I would say for this evening's chat, uh, if you wanna preserve your family documents, you need to begin to do something. So borrowing from the old Nike commercial, just do it. That doesn't mean we wanna do it foolishly. It doesn't mean we wanna damage any documents in the process of preserving, uh, preserving them. It doesn't want, mean we wanna lose anything. But oh my gosh, uh, paralysis by overanalysis is pervasive everywhere. It can be really ruinous to our efforts to preserve and pass along things. So um, that's just my um, initial statement, Elizabeth. Do we want to get to that first question here? Yeah, absolutely. So the first question I see is, do you have any suggestions for my father-in-law's racing helmet with the dirt and stuff from the last time he raced his go-kart? Uh, this person was saying that their husband doesn't want it cleaned or dusted in any way. So she was thinking maybe it needs to be in plastic or some type of glass case to keep it in, but they're not sure where to find something so big. Yeah, um, that's a great beginning question. And um, I think it uh, in some ways uh, stretches our uh, limits of expertise and, and creativity, but let, let's go foundational. And there's a lot to be said for this, um, preserving something in its own context. So the helmet, the dirt, the scratches, I mean, you're preserving, you know, this helmet that was part of this individual. So kudos to you for wanting to do that. Um, there are a couple of basic things about preservation that we always want to keep in the back of our mind. So no matter what container we have, um, you want to make sure that it can breathe. So putting it in plexiglass where it's all super glued up and it's kind of suspended or resting on one edge of this cube of plexiglass, um, uh, 
um, but probably not the best thing. So if you have plexiglass, but sometimes they call them breathe holes or weep holes, if, if air can circulate, um, that's typically a good thing. Um, I really tend to go toward acid-free, lignin-free containers that look like regular office supply or paper supply boxes, but they're not. Um, they typically will hold and can be made in various sizes. So you can Google uh, preservation supplies or you can go to um, Hollinger Metal Edge. You can go to um, a Brodart has a special preservation section. So you can get a measured box that you can fill with um, a special kind of padding that you can find. It's not like your peanuts or your air bubble sheets, but this is also acid free. Um, get a container that will put nothing on the entity itself, but will just basically preserve it. It can't roll around, rattle around in the box. It should be secure in the box, but you want it held with, again, acid free, uh, maybe pure cotton. Um, I know it sounds a little silly, but make sure it's pure cotton, but sometimes cotton diapers, which you can't find much anymore, um, are great for putting that soft surrounding around a three-dimensional artifact that you want to preserve. Um, don't use the, um, quote, clean, um, you know, garage shop towels and other things that you might find in hundred for five dollars and fifty cents um, but as elizabeth is showing on on the screen there are all sizes and sorts of containers um, you can put down a little bit of change a little bit of money for this but if you really want to preserve it putting it in a box that won't interact with the artifact and that will protect it from some really critical things you don't want sunlight on your artifact Sunlight typically will fade anything, will fade everything. You don't want it in an environment that fluctuates. Hot, cold, hot, cold, high humidity, low humidity, very damp, very dry. All those changes in uh, environmental conditions. Gaylord Archival um, is another great, great uh, and website. They gave a program for us. Um, this one, Preserving Documents and Photos Found in Genealogy Research. I'll put a link to that in the chat. And also, Melissa Barker, the archives lady, mm -hmm. she actually gave a program for us several months ago on preserving textiles and handmade treasures. So I'm going to put links to both in the chat. And even though the helmet isn't a textile or a handmade treasure, right. uh, you can glean a lot of great tips, great suggestions, and great uh sites to look for containers so that's, yeah. that's, an, that's an awesome question and kind of a cool thing to do like this is um you know my father-in-law's racing helmet and here's the grit and the dirt and yeah um, you you can get a feel for it um if you're going to get real scientific and i'm not suggesting this nor am i saying you shouldn't do it it's a personal preference um, what you could do, and this is Kurt being just way out on the edge here, what you could do is if some dirt has fallen off, you can basically have that dirt tested at your local university or if you have a minor in chemistry, just to make sure there isn't something terribly acetic or corrosive in the dirt that while you'd like to preserve the dirt from the last race, it may actually be working against you by eating at the helmet. Um, it's a remote chance that that's happening, but if you want to be like super, super, super careful and you can easily and economically test that it's just regular good old farm racetrack dirt or whether it's um, they kind of smoothed out the track with oil based something or other they scraped off the side of the road um, that could, you know, eventually impact your preservation efforts. So great question. Thank you very much for, for that question. So yeah, and the, the next question is quasi-related about archival supplies, um, how to preserve paper items, good sources to find archival supplies. So we mentioned Hollinger, we mentioned Gaylord. You mentioned another one. Google's your friend. Yeah. Um, 
Now, be careful as you would with appliances, jewelry, shoes, clothes. If it's like a wonky sounding looking website, not well organized, um, kind of have to fight to find the button to view and to purchase. Um, there are scams and shams everywhere. Uh, going with more mainstream archival suppliers really kind of guarantees that if you have a box that's acid free and lignin free, that's really acid free. Um, so just, you know, buyer beware, make sure that you're uh, getting what you think you're paying for. A good example of something that claims that it's acid free that isn't Avery products from Office Depot, they claim that they're acid free, they are not. Don't store your documents and that stuff. Just don't do it. Yeah. It was cheap, yeah. but you get what you pay for sometimes. And another trick um, that is used by marketing folks bless them, they, they also need to make a living, um, is to call it archival quality, archival yeah. sound. Um, if it doesn't say acid free, or if it doesn't say lignin free, I mean, anything can be archival quality. I mean, yeah. can be claimed who's, who's because archive? There, yeah, there's no standard. We can declare anything archival quality. We can declare the freshly new, uh, newly laid section of sidewalk in front of my house archival quality because it's brand new. It doesn't mean anything. So don't, don't be uh, tricked by that. Um, also, you probably have noticed, there is a connection here. Have you noticed Facebook's new name and their new symbol, Meta? You know, that little side of eight standing or sitting resting on its side. Um, that also, historically has been a universal symbol for truly acid-free, truly archival quality, truly lignin free Like that's really archival quality. So you can look for uh, that meta symbol and know this isn't a commercial for, for Facebook or meta. Cool. So it looks like um, Shannon is asking, what is the best way to preserve letters written in the 1970s? Some with ink pen, some um, written uh, with pencil. Um, we have to honor, bless those people who wrote in pencil because lead is inert and uh, it doesn't fade, bleed, etc. It can be rubbed off. It can be not very bright to begin with, but just making that that passing comment, um, lead is is inert. But um, what's the best way to preserve letters written in the 1970s? Well, typically in the 1970s, the paper was pretty poor, paper quality pretty poor, probably a higher acetic content than paper of a century earlier. Uh, even though more more letters are written. So um, I don't want to elongate this answer too much. So I'm going to go brief first. And then if, if we have just a few more seconds, I may go into some detail. And then I certainly welcome your comments, Elizabeth. Um, so putting every single letter page flattened, don't keep it folded up if it was mailed in an envelope or folded to fit in a notebook. Um, keep it flat and keep it in its own um, acid-free environment. Um, that can get expensive. I know there are some archivists that really pan this concept, but I believe it's valid for us. If you have acid-free folders and acid-free paper, you can put a letter, say it's a three-page letter, put a letter page behind a piece of acid-free paper put another piece of acid-free paper, another letter page. So everything that's touching that letter is acid-free. So the pages of the three-page letter do not touch each other anymore. A number of us like the idea because it looks better and it's easier to peruse um, is to put the letters in their own acid-free mylar sleeves. So you can put them in a file folder and it's acid-free mylar sleeves that have a weep hole or a breathe hole in them. So they're sealed almost, 
on all of three sides, you insert the letter. Some have a way that you can seal the fourth side. I wouldn't worry so much about that. Nice mylar sleeves, acid free. While we're thinking about preserving, if you really value those letters, I would really strongly suggest that you scan them, that you digitize them, if you will, um, as you're rehoming them in acid-free mylar sleeves or interleaving them between acid-free uh, sheets of paper. Um, when you have documents, they should be stored flat. And if you want to store them in folders standing up, the folders have to be tight. You don't want your documents to create some kind of weird curve uh, in the paper. So flat or standing straight up. And there's all kinds of acid-free uh, things you can put in a box, in a container, in a Princeton file to keep things standing, standing straight up. But you want the letters to be in a total acid-free environment. You want them protected from sunlight, fluctuations in temperature and humidity. Um, the unintended uh, bad things that can happen at the hands of children and uh, family pets. Um, it, it's amazing those things um, can happen. So um, that's my advice. Thoughts, Elizabeth? All completely valid statements. Um, I would add that when Kurt says, you know, out of the sunlight, you know, in a place where temperature fluctuations won't happen, he does not mean to put it in something that is fireproof or sealed. Is Kerr mentioned a couple of times you want it to breathe. If you put documents in, say, a fireproof safe, that inside the fireproof safe creates its own little ecosystem yeah. and your documents will, and photos will be destroyed. Yeah, it, it can be an extremely unhealthy ecosystem very quickly. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So Absolutely. don't do that. Um, Sometimes, anyway. dep depending on the ink and the paper, the ink will bleed and it will continue to kind of like diffuse, like the letters get fatter and fatter and the ink looks like it's it, it's diffusing. That's why I always say, if, if you want to preserve it, you know, Scan catch it. a digital copy of it because, you know, then you'll have how it looks with our technology today. We can make facsimiles that look really close to original so you can frame the facsimile you can display at a family reunion the facsimile. You can have people with their uh, cake and coffee stained hands <laughs> and tablecloths looking at, at, at these documents. So um, grabbing ex things. excellent point, Elizabeth, about don't, don't create unintentionally a special environment that's going to enhance uh, deterioration. So while you were talking, uh, that had reminded me this is probably read backwards. I don't think this is the right direction, but this is my great grandmother's journal. It begins in 1918. I recently rescued it from my parents' house. My mother had it wrapped in tissue paper, the kind of tissue paper you put with like Christmas presents. And then inside of a Ziploc bag for decades. It's fine, I'm fine. Doesn't hurt my soul at all. But I rescued it. <laughs> uh, and what I did was, so the binding is in bad shape. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I got a tabletop tripod and photographed the, I took little weights to hold the pages open and I just photographed it. And what I did was I created a facsimile. Awesome. Yeah. This is the awesome. proof copy that I did just to see what it would look like printed. Mm -hmm. I intend on doing another copy soon that with some replacement images that didn't look too good printed. But right. yeah, these are some of the things that you can do. Uh, but that way we can actually read the contents of the right. journal, which is real juicy, lots of drama. Because she was young and she was, you know, she was talking about, you know, being irritated that this, this man or that man wouldn't call her back. And it's a whole thing. And I learned that my great grandfather mailed her her engagement ring. She had a list of men's names in the back of different men that she had dated and how 
like they're all crossed out like kind of angrily it's great it's great stuff but i can read that without worrying about destroying the journal in the process so that is so awesome elizabeth you've done what we were just talking about yes that, i've done it that's that that that's awesome that that really is really so, is awesome um, you reminded me when you said the binding is kind of kind of in tatters yeah. this is a decision that each one of us have to make with our own artifacts so in the process of cleaning out my mother's house i discovered it's like still i can't believe this because my parents really didn't pay any attention to preserving any of this stuff um, in fact my father thought it was rather much a waste of time um, and said so with some frequency um, i found these five five-year journals of my mother's aunt on her maternal side. And I think Elizabeth, it may not come close to yours in juiciness, but I've already just skimmed a couple pages and it's like, oh, I'm not sure I know what that means, but hmm, I have questions, as one of our colleagues would say, I have questions. But when you have something like that has a spine that, that's tattered or has pages that are ripped, be careful. Yeah. Do you really want to repair it? I really advocate what you did, Elizabeth, and that's, okay, let's put this somewhere where it's safe and supported without yeah. rebinding it, putting yeah, Elmer's yeah. glue and whatever other things you find at Michael's or some other art craft store, because that can accelerate deterioration. You really mm -hmm. should know what you're doing when you apply acid-free adhesive when you try to make a new binding. Yeah. Um, it's not trivial, and you know that it's not trivial because if you send it to a preservationist, oh my gosh, all of your fun money will be spent and then some to get something yeah. rebound or to get yeah. pages uh, repaired. So keeping it as you've done, Elizabeth, in a nice acid-free container away from. And also elements. friends lay it flat. Right. Don't, because if you, even if you still have books on your shelves. So I also rescued among the many other things I rescued from that house, some of her, her, her books, her textbooks from when she was in finishing school. And yes, she went to finishing school. Um, when the books are like this, like upright as they would normally be on the shelf, that puts unnecessary weight on the spine. And if it's already kind of fragile, you, you don't want that, you want it flat. But in the process of digitizing something, going back to what Kurt said, do no harm. If you're gonna, you know, just end up destroying something in the process of trying to get a digital copy, don't do it. Um, in my case, this would never have gone onto a flatbed scanner. It would have completely fallen apart. So if you have something like that, photograph it instead, don't scan. And sometimes we forget about the power of yeah. these, you know? Um, they landed people on the moon with less technology that are in our smart devices. So <laughs> know the power that's in your hands. Um, in, For in sure. The arena. Some people are sharing in the chat their horror stories about safes and mold and, oh God, it hurts. It hurts. Don't so do I, it. <laughs> right. I'm jumping down um, a little bit. Someone asked, what is the best way to show and preserve a signed football so the signatures don't fade? That's a great question. It brings to mind um, the Detroit Pistons. They started in Fort Wayne, Indiana as the Fort Wayne Zollner Pistons. And why do I tell you about that useless fact? Is because they were celebrating some kind of anniversary here at the library well more than two decades ago. And they had a basketball and it was signed by all the players. And they, the players in their retirement, could barely read their own signatures. Oh, yeah, that's my R, but I can't read the rest of it. So very, very legitimate question. So again, keeping the artifact out of direct sunlight, any UV light, um, don't have it on display all the time. And I know that pains us. Have it on display when you are really showing off, but to keep it out all the time and in light is just injurious. I still like the acid-free covered box approach where it's just covered up, no dirt, no dust. Um, there's no chance of anything rubbing and any you know environmental changes. Um, and that's really um, the best 
that I know to do. Elizabeth, you already gave a great piece of advice. Google it, seriously. You'll find thousands of pages, thousands of screens about how to preserve handwriting on the rubber that footballs are made of, yeah. basketball, on metal. Um, again, I would just offer, um, image it. Image the yeah. basketball, image the football that, in this example, from every different direction. If you're close to a university that actually has 3D scanning, oh my gosh, become a friend with the technician or the archivist that's using that 3D scanning and they can 3D scan the football. And then you have an actual digital artifact that you can turn and manipulate with your mouse or with a touch screen. And, and that's kind of cool, but it all goes to um, make a copy of it. Um, what's the old saying? Nothing is forever. So, um, but that would be my advice on that. It's kind of related. Somebody had asked about displaying their a, a baptism dress. Um, I mean, it, it, typically in the long run, it's better to keep that stuff out of sunlight. But that specific question, I do recall that being brought up during Melissa Barker's program about um, about preserving textiles and things. So I'm going to put that in the chat again, because I, I remember she specifically talked about things like baptismal dresses and wedding dresses. If you want to hear a scary wedding dress story of my mother, you know how when you get married, they say if you're going to store your wedding dress, you need to get it heirloomed. She didn't do that. She had it, again, wrapped in tissue paper. It was the thing. It was the cheap thing. She got married in 1974 or 76. It's one of those years. It is so yellow. It's more yellow than like this yellow that I'm sitting on. It's a dark, scary yellow. And she's like, it's fine. It's fine. It's not. No, it's not. But okay, you tell yourself that. So I, I would just um, offer that um, you all investigate this at legitimate sites. Uh, Society of American Archivists, again, as you said, Elizabeth, Google is your friend. Um, I have heard, and I have two family members, distant family members, not close, but cousins, second cousins, um, who have done this, and they would swear by it with not only wedding dresses, not only baptismal dresses and outfits, First Communion, but military um, outfits and wedding tuxes for the guys, etc. I mean, all kinds of reasons that people want to want to preserve something. Um, if you go to um, a bona fide, and we could talk all night on what that means, but if you go to a legitimate dry cleaner who offers that service, I have heard, and again, you'll want to verify that. You'll want to check the veracity of my comment that having it dry cleaned, folded, not pressed, but folded without having folds and then sealed with that inert gas, and I'm blanking on what that gas is, yeah. that that lasts for decades. How long after that? Don't know. Yeah. But again, Google it and, and see what's recommended. And, and don't go to, you know, Larry, Daryl, and Daryl's website to find, you know, how to store an heirloom uh, costume, uniform, dress, but go to a legitimate um, website. There's, I bet if you Googled Melissa Barker, you'd find all kinds of awesome things that she would share with you about textile preservation. Um, I know just enough to not to know that I don't know much. Uh, I know you don't want to fold things. You don't want creases in things because yeah. that, um, after a very short number of years, you won't ever be able to get it straight. Um, you really want it not on display. I mean, you just don't want it on display, um, which always makes me have a small affinity toward what the dry cleaners are able to do. The ones who legitimately can roll and package and seal with inert gas, because you can kind of hold it up and say, you can see the pattern, the lace, the uh, uniform, the colors, et cetera. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it, it can be challenging.
someone brought up something kind of funny in the chat that they wonder about wedding gowns that have been you know cleaned and sealed in boxes and then they're open decades later what if it's the wrong dress because <laughs> you wouldn't necessarily know <laughs> that's yeah, that's funny um surprise right. surprise <laughs> um okay we have a lot of questions in here and i yeah, just want to preemptively say if we don't get to all of your questions you know feel free to send us an email we're always happy to answer your questions that's why we're doing this program yeah. to try and, to answer your questions and for those of you who are just joining us uh no we aren't elizabeth, elizabeth and i are not the scheduled presenter for this evening but we've turned this into a preservation uh sort of fireside chat so thank you for indulging us and thank you for your great uh, comments in the chat and your question. So let's get to Carol's question if we can. Um, she goes, I recently found old photographs from my mother's family that I determined were from the 1910s to the 1920s. I've been able to figure out who some of the relatives are, but there are others that appear to be um, appear to be my relatives' friends taken at Sylvan Lake, Rome City. Any ideas on how I can determine who these other people are? So how many hours you got, Carol? <laughs> and, I, and I'm just being a, a little a little silly here on a Thursday evening. Um, yes, there are ways. If you don't mind, Elizabeth, before I like dive off the deep end right away, <laughs> do you have some ideas? And then I'll weigh in with some kind of interesting things we ought to at least keep an eye peeled for. So yeah, how do we know some some of these relatives are? Yeah. But some of them are friends. Yeah. Ask other family members. Bingo. Yeah. Ask other Everyone. family members. Show them around. And if you're really interested in preserving the photographs, don't show the originals around. Scan, oh, yeah. them, scan them, post them on your blog, your Facebook page, send them Ancestry. to Twitter, answer. Yeah. Yeah. Post them everywhere. Ask people. Um, you'd be amazed. Even sometimes the relative who you thought really wasn't paying much attention ever or the person who's like distant, distant, distant relative, um, they may know, they may know. Um, so I'm gonna try just a little bit of wonkiness on you, but I kind of believe this and, that, and that's why I'm sharing it. So if you have a collection of photographs, there is more than just a remote possibility that even the photographs of people you don't recognize, there was likely a reason that the, the relative that collected those photographs put them together. So put on your historical detective hat and can you discern from who you recognize in the photograph or what else is in the background of the photograph? Could have this possibly been a family reunion, a neighborhood celebration, um, a barn raising, uh, crop planting, who knows? But there had to be likely, not 100% of the time, but there had to likely be a reason why the original collector brought those photographs together. See if you can use the whole photograph. Maureen Taylor, the photo detective, has awesome tips on how to use the whole photograph. Use everything, the background, costumes, buttons, to date and place the photograph. Do that same thing. Like, why is this photograph of unknowns amongst my knowns? Secondly, um, if you're digitizing, Go ahead and include those photographs of that are totally people you don't know. Um, I know there's been all kinds of discussion for years about facial recognition. There's all kinds of privacy issues around facial recognition. I'm not even going to touch on any of that. What I can tell you with a lot of certainty, um, but I don't have anything that I can like share in a broadcast mode, many, many, many entities in the genealogy space are playing with facial recognition. In our lifetimes, even if we're 80, there will likely be some feature that's easily usable and easily findable um, that will be kind of like DNA search results, DNA results in the early days of DNA. It'll give us just one more tool in our toolkit to say, Truly, this is someone not of our family. Or maybe due to facial recognition, we might be able to compare it to 
silos of known photographs in our own archive, or maybe just, uh, you know, websites that collect interesting photographs without identifying who's in the photograph. So before you casually toss these as, yeah, I'm only interested in my relatives, um, you might want to A, explore why this picture is part of the collection, and then B, why not scan it and make yourself available for any of the new facial recognition techniques that eventually they're going to work out the privacy issues. They're going to work out the science behind it. Um, it's the, pretty amazing. There's um, one facial recognition company. I am drawing a blank on what it's called. If those who are interested in that, send us an email because it will probably come to me after this program because the, the person who created this thing and it's really cool did a program for us like several months ago and I, I cannot remember what it's called right now it's only because you brought it up Kurt. related faces yes, yes. thank you edward yeah. no, y'all are saving me this Thursday right. evening. <laughs> yeah. no, um, no, um all kinds of ways it, it's about you and i being good historical detectives right um you know asking that basic question and using costume and background and images to try to place context they're trying to place the, the individuals in context. I had found some photographs on Ancestry of my great grandmother's biological father uh, from 1920 and his second wife and some other family members of the second wife and some other random people. And I messaged a guy on Ancestry saying, what are these pictures? He's like, oh, well, I think they went on vacation. Uh, these were all taken. Um, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, come to find out, my great great grandfather went to Albuquerque with his new wife on vacation and then just lived there. They just didn't go back for a couple of years and abandoned the kids. It's like a whole thing. So, the with the documents day. and the context clues, yeah. great stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, oh, I, I see a question that's a really important one. Okay, go for it. Some good ideas for removing photos from the old picture books, but the plastic cover and the slip backs, all I've heard of is dental floss for the bottom. Doesn't help with the top though. Okay, so removing photographs that are stuck in the photo albums. Thoughts, Kurt? Um, yeah, my first thought is ouch. Um, it goes back to what you and I have both said this evening, Elizabeth, and that's do no harm. Um, they used to call those, and, and I still laugh, um, even if sometimes the smile isn't on my face. When those first came on the market, they were called magnetic photo albums. And I was like, how in the world and why did you call these magnetic? There's nothing magnetic about it. It's acetic adhesive that's bonding your photographs to acetic pages and kind of creating their own little special environment. And then we put acetic plastic over the top and it binds all around them as well. It's wonderful. We have so many examples of um, acetic magnetic photo albums where it's such a toxic environment that there's mold and mildew that grow and show you where the adhesive lines are if they haven't already yellowed and turned brown on you. So one of the best things um, is to um, remember when going forward, do no harm, do no harm. Photographs should float freely in a nice acetic um, photograph box. It almost looks like an old recipe box, but acid-free, not acetic box, but an acid-free box. Um, there are many, many wonderful acid-free photo albums, totally acid-free, where the photograph just floats between the acid-free mylar and the back page. There's even a place between the photographs where you can put some kind of identification, a number, or actually a a caption. But to your question, um, for some of it, it's just really no good answer. Um, sometimes it's just lots of patience, and I mean hours of patience. So after you've tried things like dental floss, you can, it's a little bit pricey, nine to $19. The really good ones can be 30 to $50. Get these micro spatulas from, again, um, Gaylord Archival, Broad Art Archival, 
and you know, put on some high magnifying readers or use a little um, stamp collecting or coin collecting magnifying glass and just try to separate with a micro spatula um, the back of the photograph from the adhesive that it's on. Um, likely won't be pretty. Um, you have to make sure that what you're scraping, cutting um, is the adhesive and the acetic pages as opposed to parts of the photograph itself. Um, I don't recommend, I would steer away from these magic chemicals that automatically know what's acid-free paper and what's adhesive and what's the back of your photograph. Um, sometimes with some adhesives, and again, I haven't done this, so you need to check my veracity on this. Sometimes distilled, pure distilled water can help with some adhesives kind of loosen it. In my mind's eye, and I'm not a chemist, don't play one on TV, seems to me it could also help bind some adhesives as well. Um, great shots there, Elizabeth, of things that you're showing from Gaylord Archival. So I know that's this not a great a answer. Spatula. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, and that makes some sense, right? If we yeah. can get the adhesive that's probably dried out and crusty, if we can yeah. kind of get chemistry to work on our behalf. If you those. don't feel comfortable doing that, though, if, if you, like, know, know yourself, okay? Right. If you know that if I try to do this, I am just going to destroy the thing, don't do it. Right. <laughs> Take right. a picture of it. You can use an overhead scanner like these if it won't fit on a flatbed scanner without it getting like messed up. And I do want to point out that, I think it's this scanner. Yes, is it yeah. you? Yeah. yeah. Um, we have one of these. No, um, we don't. No, we don't. We have two of those. <laughs> we have two. <laughs> yeah, we have two. Because um, we have this wonderful partnership with Vivifix where we have this scanning station in our department so you can come bring your photographs bring your documents um i've even used it to scan something that isn't a photograph or document i have these place cards from my great-grandparents wedding i can i can show it to you which are kind of cool and if you're, if you're showing them to us elizabeth you're still on screen share oh i'm sorry there we go. Yeah. So um, I, I've even used it for these. And you can use a Vivid Pix um, Restore software to clean it up a little bit. Uh, it's, it's good stuff, and you can use it for free. So just thought I'd point, out, point that out for those who might be local or planning on visiting us soon. Yeah. Um. Great advice. I'm going to grab a quick question. What would be a good way to preserve a Civil War sword? We have the um, uh, scabbard and currently in a wood case. Um, is this safe for it? Um, yes, it's safe. Is it best? Uh, no. Um, so a lot of Civil War reenactors, um, they have blogs and what I call um, related niche sites where they do talk about the best ways to preserve armaments. And again, going to a major site um, is just a great way that, good job, Elizabeth. I mean, right off the top, um, uh, great, great advice there. Um, so I would just refer you to websites like this. Um, they're not in as much danger of going away if we stabilize the environment. Sometimes our best ideas, not validated by certified preservationists and archivists, um, some of our best ideas actually do more damage than um, the sword that may have lived on the Gettysburg battlefield or at Antietam for decades before it was discovered or in someone's garage for generations after it was discovered. So be careful what you polish it with, what you do to it. Um, but um, um, that's what I would I would recommend. So thanks for that question. Uh, and there Christine. are videos too. Yeah. So Google's your friend, just, but do your research. We, 
we do research all day about our families. Right. Why wouldn't she do research about how to preserve her stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Um, kind of a related question, Elizabeth, is one for Carol puts in there. Hi, I have one of my dad's World War II officers caps. He was a second lieutenant in the Air Force. Go Air Force. My dad was in the Air Force as well. Um, it has a small rip in it. Should I just photograph it and put it on Ancestry? I don't know what to do with it. Um, that's kind of a tough question, probably tougher than you intended. Um, what do you want to do yeah. with it? Do you want to share the image? Then yes, photograph it from many different angles. Again, if you're in a university town that has the 3D scanner, that could be fun. Um, do you want to make sure that your great-grandchildren's great-grandchildren actually see the cap? Um, then you'll want to pay more attention to the artifact. You'll want to do the same kind of thing. But again, check me on this. You want to create an acid-free container. You don't want it to rattle around in a big box. Uh, you don't want um, insects, um, high temperature, low temperature, high humidity, low, low humidity. You want to stabilize it. Uh, keep light uh, away from it. Um, keep unintentional harm of kids and pets away from it. And bugs. Uh, bugs, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Silverfish, you name it, the whole the whole nine yards. So um, depends on what you want to do with it. If you're just like, yeah, this is a cap, it's ripped. I don't really want it anymore, but I want to share the image of it. So um, one of the things that... Um, I notice we forget to say, at least I do, I know you've mentioned it a couple times, Elizabeth, and that is, you know, Google's your friend. You know what else is your friend? YouTube. There are some amazing YouTube videos that are quite instructional. Um, yeah, there are some where, um, you know, the mental image of Larry, Daryl, and Daryl come to mind, and you just see people kind of making it up on the fly. Uh, but Go to a trusted site, go to someone who is speaking with authority, who gives you places to check, who gives you, gives you places to go. But there's an amazing number of um, YouTube videos. Um, kind of a side tangent, and I don't want to steal too many seconds of our time, but all four of my sons, when they're hooking up a new washer, lawnmower, snowblower, or their new iPhone, where's the first place they go? They go to YouTube, they watch a couple of videos, they got it, they do it right, they hook it up, it works. I think that same kind of strategy can work with a lot of things, including wonderful World War II Air Force caps. I just want to point out that uh, if you don't have like a university or something of that nature near you that does 3D scanning, you can rent them apparently. Just Google 3D okay. scanners for rent and a whole list of websites comes up. So look, look into that. Could that could be fun too. That could be yeah, fun as well. For sure. Yeah. Maybe um, that's a special project of the Genealogy Center someday in the future. Rent 3D about. scanners and yeah. Yeah, that'd be fun. Uh, I see a good question in here uh, that can also kind of relate to our department. Uh, someone was asked, saying that they have funeral books where people attended the funerals of uh, her grandparents and signed, you know, the guest book, um, and they were bound. So she was first asking how to best preserve them, and she's saying they're from 1960 and 67. One, I would scan them first, mm -hmm. and right. if you do that, you should send us a copy. <laughs> Because that's the type of stuff we really, we, we like to add to our free databases. They're, it's really useful genealogical like data. So if you're interested, send us an email. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I totally endorse that concept. And before you um, accuse us, and perhaps rightly so, of being um, too self-serving, um, it truly is another part of your preservation plan, right? What's that old saying? Locks. Lots of copies keep stuff safe. And okay, so you don't want to send it to the Genealogy Center in Fort Wayne because it's a funeral uh, book from someone in Denton, Missouri or in Albany, New York. Well, then find an entity there to send a digital copy to. Um, even though I have to add, we collect from around the world. So it would fit in our collection too. But truly find, find a place to donate a digital entity just to ensure that that data um, is 
is preserved and available. And everything, as Elizabeth said, kind of a redundant statement here, everything on our free databases side is free. So no login, no subscription card, no annual fee, no access fee. You can be anywhere in the world. And somebody actually brought up that uh, we scanned some Civil War diaries for them. Yeah. To, to add into uh, probably the our military heritage database. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, after scanning, I would put those into a box like like this one, flat. Uh, I can even open this box. It's packed rather tightly with tissue paper. Yep. Yep. But not yep. too tight, just so it doesn't rattle around in there. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so a couple quick questions. Um, where did you buy get those weights that you referred to? So the weights that I had used there, there were actually fidget spinner weights. Uh, do I have any on my desk? I usually have them laying around here somewhere. It seemed to have walked away. Uh, but you can buy weights. They're usually cord. Some I like the ones that are cords better than the fidget spinner weights. It's just what I could find at the time due to supply chain issues, yeah. what have you. Um, yeah. You can find them on Amazon, Gaylor Archival. Um, yeah, all the archival all, sites all that the you and I have mentioned. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. All the places. All and and no, we don't have any stock in any of those companies. <laughs> They're no, just no, good, no. good, legitimate, yeah. legitimate yeah. companies. So, yeah. Very good. Um, I think um, Elaine has this question that's sort of directed to you. Is it better to take pictures like Elizabeth did or to scan pages, which seems slow? Um. I took pictures because of the um, of the condition of the the book I was taking photographs of. Uh, it's about the same speed uh, as as it would take to scan, in my opinion. Um, it, the only reason why it didn't take me longer was because my the camera I was using. Uh, has an app that works with it because I had to have the camera kind of high to get the entire book. And there was someone who asked if I used a light source when doing that, just natural light, had the curtains pulled open in my office, in my house. Uh, so I didn't put light on it. It wasn't necessary. So the only reason why I went faster is there's, there was an app so I could make the camera fire from my phone as I was turning pages. Right but it, speed takes about the same amount of time um but i wasn't trying to go fast because i wanted to be as careful as possible turning some of these pages that were kind of delicate good deal thank thank you for that i wish um russ asked i wish to know who to give an old doc? clock Clock. The clock. Okay. The clock. clock. Okay. To when I'm gone. It's over a hundred years old and some other family items. I seem to have no family member that would appreciate that. This is your favorite rant, Kurt. <clears throat> well, uh, uh, kind of. Um, so not really a good answer. I, I have to revert back to what do you want to do? Um, sometimes um, there are family members out there. We just haven't communicated with them. We just really haven't sought them out. So I guess um, not knowing your particular circumstance, I would um, redouble, triple my efforts to really identify family members and to share images, pictures of what it is you're interested in, in preserving. Um, typically, and, and I, this may not be you, so I'm not directing it at anyone individually. It's just that I've known a number of individuals uh, in my life, family members, friends, associates, retired colleagues, et cetera, who are just all dead set excited because this little thing that they have is really valuable. Um, like um, these wonderful old books from 1901, from 1871. And some of those are really valuable. 
And there are ways of finding that out through antiquarian dealers, add all, A-D-D-A-L-L.com, add all website can help begin to give you values of book materials. Um, but please also recognize that sometimes an old book is just that, an old book. It's worth 95 cents on a garage sale table or a nickel some, somewhere else. Um, so I only offer that as um, it probably has more emotional or sentimental value in some instances than it actually does antiquarian value. So again, redouble your efforts to see if there's a family member, um, an associate of a family member, a distant cousin um, who, who might be interested. And, and sometimes things, again, that have really high sentimental value to you. Like let's say the wind-up music boxes. Um, those were all the rage uh, years ago, decades ago. Um, <clears throat> so the wind-up mechanism is broke. A couple prongs off of the entity, I don't know the official name, that hits the spokes that makes the sound is missing. Um, the cover is scratched. One of the sides is gone. It's really a cool music box. It's wonderful. I'm sure it's worth a lot of money. No, it's not. It's broken. It's not worth a whole lot. Unless you have some provenance, which says, this came from King Louis II. And it passed through these hands. And this is how it got to Denton County, Missouri in the year 2022. So um, not sure I answered that very clearly or very well. Sometimes old stuff is just old stuff. But let's double, triple our efforts to identify family members who really might be interested in that. I know my four sons for their grandfather, my wife's father. I mean, he was... He was the near perfect grandfather that ever walked on planet earth. And they took everything that was left of his when the estate was settled from broken watch chain links to a beat up old wrist watch that you could barely see the face of it, but the hands were still there. Why? It was hugely valuable to them because of the sentimental attachment. That's, you know, so, any thoughts you have that are more precise and clear than mine, Elizabeth? No, you pretty much covered it. <laughs> um, I, I do want to say that one person had said in the chat that they have the same issue uh, with some military memorabilia of their husbands. And I think theirs as well, saying that no one wants awards and mementos. Um, if a local museum entity does not want them we might depending on what it is or can yeah. add to that yeah. if there's anything to add to that imaging those entities yeah. um, the the metals etc on our military heritage portion of our free databases that elizabeth mentioned a little bit ago um, you can find all sorts of things so it's not just pension files and service records um, but I actually put up um, a page, a web page um, for my father and my father-in-law. And you can see, you know, we took just nice camera, digital camera images of Purple Hearts, of service medals, of other things, um, as well as the paper documents, the two-dimensional items like photographs, um, letters, etc. So um, yeah, it's yeah. it's pretty cool to be able to preserve that 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 material and kind of add to your story. Um, so many of our ancestors participated in military activities. Um, if you go under, if you're looking for an example that I just yeah. shared, <laughs> um, if you go into Korean War, and then individuals, my father Charles Witcher should be there. Yeah, and oh. so um, a lot of military stuff and I just kept chumming in things. Um, you know, it, it, interesting why you should leave no document undiscovered, unevaluated. Uh, that first thing that you showed the list of- um, The medals list. Yeah, the medals list. 
You know what I found this out about my father? Hmm. I found this out when he died. He never talked about wow. any of this. Now, I don't, I haven't researched yet. Um, you know, a, a service medal is a service medal, but heck, I would like to see that. Um, his, um, you know, National you know, Defense Service Medal, good, con good Conduct Medal. I'm sure a good number of Air Force people got that. I'd still like to see that. I would still would have liked to know about that during his life, but he never talked about it. The only thing he told us was he was a crypto agent. So he decoded and coded messages as they were moving back and forth. Um, and he told us their phrase, what you see here and what you do here. When you leave here, leave it here. Um, I always thought that was kind of cute as a kid and still think it's mm -hmm. kind of cute. But um, the whole idea is the more we discover documents and evaluate documents and use life circumstances and end of life situations, um, we just discover more and more and more. So it's good to preserve things because other people and new eyes will come and look at these and find even more of our stories. Um, so um, good stuff. Um, we are out of time. And I think that's a good note to end on. Sure. Uh, so thanks everybody for, for joining us for this tonight's program. I know it wasn't exactly what all of you were expecting, but I hope you all had a good time regardless. Uh, if we didn't get to your question, feel free to send us an email. Our email is genealogy at acpl.info, which I put that in the chat, but I'm gonna put it in the chat again. Uh, if you'd like a copy of the chat, cause I know I've been putting a lot of links into the chat, send us an email and we'll get that to you. All right, so. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I hope you enjoyed the surprise as much as we enjoyed spending some time with you. So um, use all the resources available to you and there are so many of them. And thank you again for joining us. Have a good night.